today, brothers and sisters. It's a privilege for me to be sharing God's Word. And uh, I'd like to thank Pastor Franco and the I Disciple team for this privilege. Last year, I was assigned the topic, the supremacy of Christ in His holiness. And now, I'm given this uh, topic, the supremacy of Christ in His church. And just being able to study in depth The supremacy of Christ has been so beneficial for my soul. So thank you so much, I Disciple Philippines. As we begin, we want to ask the question, who is supreme in your church? Who is supreme in our local churches? I remember attending together for the Gospel 2010, It was such a joy and privilege to be there. I was just, you know, watching these speakers through YouTube. And uh, finally, I was uh, there being able to sit down and hear them in person. And one of the speakers I was looking forward to hear was John Piper. And John Piper has been such a blessing in my life. And uh, not only in my life, but in the entire Uh, family of the Caparis family. We're so blessed with the ministry of John Piper. Now, before his session, there was a a break, and I believe it was a dinner time, and I did not eat my dinner. I did not uh, go out even from the venue. I just stood there waiting at the entrance of the hall, waiting to hear John Piper. I did not travel from Cebu to Louisville, Kentucky just to sit at the very back. I wanted to have a good seat, not only for myself, uh, my dad was with me, my mom, my sister. And so I wanted all of us to have good seats. And so I waited there at the entrance. And there were 7,000 participants during that year and so it was so difficult to find a seat that you want so we wanted to make sure we had good seats as the time drew near for the session the line grew longer and longer and longer and I was uh, talking to the person beside me and he was very candid in his observation as he looked at the long line of people waiting to hear John Piper speak, he said, let's pray for the idolatry in our hearts. Let's pray for the idolatry in our hearts. And that is so true. In our sinfulness, sometimes we don't even realize, we don't even notice it, but sometimes we make man supreme In our churches, celebrity pastors become our idols and we're exalting men to a position that they are not worthy of. And if we're not careful, we could sound so similar to the people in Corinth wherein Paul was telling them in his letter that you guys, you know, all you say is, I follow Paul. I follow Apollos. I follow Peter. Their loyalty was now towards men, exalting men above Christ. Yes, we are to honor our leaders. We are to honor those who serve the Lord. But we must draw the line between honoring our leaders and idolizing them. We must honor them, yes, but we must never cross the line of idolizing men because that's exalting men above Christ. Elevating man over Christ is not only a danger in the seeker-sensitive, pragmatic, shallow doctrine churches. Even with healthy churches, biblically sound churches, This is a great danger. Because of our sinful eyes, we tend to focus on man rather than Christ. 
And so we need to be careful with that. And what is the antidote? The antidote is we must bow down to the supremacy of Christ in all things. We must remember that. We must preach that in the pulpits and even to ourselves and even in our small groups. We must bow down to the supremacy of Christ alone in all things. Now we will be talking about the supremacy of Christ in His church, but as we unpacked Colossians 1, 15 to 20, we will realize that Christ is not only supreme in the church. It's not only in the realm of the church that Christ is supreme, but Christ is supreme in all things, in absolutely all things. So let's read Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. It says here, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, O Lord God, that Christ is supreme in all creation. In, he is supreme in all things. He's supreme in the church. He is supreme in salvation. And we pray, O oh Lord God, as we unpack Colossians 1, 15 to 20, our eyes would be in awe and wonder of how great our Christ is, that we would see Him as He truly is. We thank You, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. The church in Colossae, now, uh, not a lot of people know that it's not actually Paul who planted the church in Colossae. It was an ordinary guy named Epaphras. And during Paul's ministry in Ephesus, somehow Epaphras stumbled or went to Ephesus and he heard the preaching of the gospel and as he heard the preaching of the gospel, he responded in joy. And uh, as he grew in his knowledge and understanding of the gospel, he went to his hometown in Colossae. He traveled back to Colossae, started sharing the gospel. And then a church was born in that place. And that's an encouragement for all of us because God can use anyone, even an ordinary believer like Epaphras, to share the gospel and to plant a church. Never underestimate the power of the gospel. The Colossian church was doing well until a heresy invaded the church. Uh, Paul does not explicitly name the, the heresy, but uh, what we could gather from the letter, it's, it's a mixture. The heresy is a mixture of Greek philosophies, pagan practices, Jewish legalism. And, and that sounds so complicated. It's a syncretistic system of belief. 
And it's so complicated, but it's on the surface that it's complicated. A mixture of all these things, but, but the root is really simple. The heresy is what we would call like a halo-halo theology or chapsui theology. And so with all these mixture of different beliefs, we might think it's so difficult for us to deal with that kind of a teaching. But again, it's really simple as you go to the root. The root is the undermining of Christ. It is not valuing Christ, not magnifying Christ, not lifting up the sufficiency and the supremacy of Christ. It is making other things more important than Christ. It is looking at other things and giving more significance to other things than Christ. It is a heresy that says Christ is not enough. And that's really the root of the heresy. Christ is not enough. You need to add Greek philosophy to your faith. You need to add pagan practices to your faith. You need to add Jewish legalism to your faith. Christ is not enough. And so when Paul heard of this heresy, as this was reported to him by Epaphras, he then wrote this letter this was around 60 AD, and Paul was in prison at that time. But he, even though he was in that situation, still wrote a letter to the church in Colossae. And he wrote the letter to declare, you don't need these Greek philosophies. You don't need these pagan practices and add them to your faith. You don't need Jewish legalism. Christ is enough. Christ is more than enough. Christ is sufficient. Christ is superior. Christ is supreme, unrivaled. That's who Jesus is. And as we gaze upon the supremacy of Christ in Colossians 1, 15 to 20, I pray that we would just see how Christ indeed is enough and how Christ is more than enough. Most New Testament scholars believe that uh, verses 15 to 20 is a hymn in praise to Christ. And um, in this hymn, the first thing that uh, we will see is the supremacy of Christ in creation. The supremacy of Christ in creation and under that I see six reasons why Christ is supreme over all creation verse 15 let's go back it says he is the image of the invisible God and so the first reason why Christ is supreme over all creation is because he is the image of God God is spirit and because he is spirit, he's not composed of a physical, material body, just like us. He does not have or not composed of material or physical bodies. We are flesh and blood, but God is spirit. God does not have flesh and blood. God is not composed of flesh, blood, and bones. He is spirit. And because he is spirit, we cannot see him. He is invisible. And this is a teaching that you find throughout Scripture. John chapter 1.18 says, No one has ever seen God. No one. And John says the same thing in 1 John 4.12. No one has ever seen God. He said it again. And even Paul in 1 Timothy 1.17 to the king of ages immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. God is spirit. And because God is spirit, he is invisible. And yet, what do we find here? The invisible God was made visible 
in Christ. The invisible God was made visible in Christ. And again, Paul says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Now, that term, image, comes from the Greek, ekon, which means image or representation. And Jesus here is the perfect image, the perfect representation of God. And this sounds very similar to the author of Hebrews and what he said in Hebrews 1.3. It says here, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. The radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. We know that we human beings, we are created in the image of God. And how is that different from Christ? Well, there's a vast difference. Because we are created in the image of God, but Jesus is the image of God. You see the difference? He is. He's the perfect. He's the exact. He's the accurate. He's the pristine. He's the precise. He's the absolutely perfect in every way representation of God. Why? Because He's equal with the Father in essence, in substance, in attributes, in nature. He's not inferior to the Father. He is equal. He is a perfect representation of God. So perfect a representation that Jesus said in John 14, 9, Have I been with you so long that you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can Jesus say this without committing blasphemy? It is because He is the perfect image. He is the perfect representation of God. He is the perfect revelation of God. And one Bible commentary says, that when Paul used this term, icon, he's also describing Christ in terms Judaism reserved for divine wisdom, which was portrayed as God's archetypal image by which he created the rest of the world. And so with that term, image, it not only points to Jesus Christ as the perfect representation of God, but it also points to the pre-existence of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the perfect image, representation, revelation of the Father. He made visible the invisible God. And as we go on in verse 15, we will then find out that Jesus is also the firstborn of all creation. Colossians 1.15, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. The first line talks about Jesus in relation to the Father. And in this second line and onwards, this is Jesus' relationship to creation. And many false teachers would actually use this term, firstborn, to introduce a false teaching. Many cults use this. And uh, they take that term too literally, that Jesus was first to be born. But was Jesus really first to be born? If you think about it, it, it does not make sense. If you read the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew and in Luke, you would find the ancestors of Christ. You'll see many names of people who were born before Christmas. So how could Jesus be the firstborn? And that's just the genealogy of Christ. There were millions of people who were born before Christ, before Christ became man. So what does this term firstborn mean? It does not mean that Jesus was first to be created or first to be born. I already talked about the pre-existence 
of Christ in the term ekon, and uh, how Jesus also is the perfect representation of the Father equal with God. So with this term, firstborn, it's from the Greek, prototokos, and uh, in this term, this is actually a title. This is a p- position. The firstborn is not the first to be born. It is a position of authority and preeminence. A position of authority and preeminence given to the firstborn son in the Old Testament. And the Jews understood what this term meant. And usually the firstborn was the one who would receive the firstborn rights. But we know that not every everyone who was first to be born was given the firstborn right. We see the example of Esau. He was the first to be born. But it was Jacob who got the rights and privileges and the status of preeminence over his elder brother. And so it's not just because you're, you're first to be born you would have that privilege. Also in Genesis 49, 3 to 4, Jacob is giving a blessing to his sons. In verse 3 to 4, he's blessing Reuben. And he said, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the first fruits of my strength, preeminent in dignity, preeminent in power. Verse 4 says, unstable as water, You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. What's the point here? It's not because you're just the firstborn, then automatically you'll have the rights of the firstborn son. Usually that's what would happen, but you could forfeit the privilege because being a firstborn is not just you're the first to be born. It is a status, it is a position, it is a title of preeminence, a position of rank or supreme authority, sovereignty of uh, rank and status of preeminence. That's what the term firstborn means. And that's why, because Jesus is the firstborn, having the rank, having the status of preeminence, He can be both the son of David and the Lord of David. He's not only the son of David, he is also the Lord of David because he has that status, he has that position of authority and preeminence. Christ is preeminent and supreme over all creation and he has the firstborn rights of all creation Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 2 says, Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. The whole universe was the inheritance of Christ. The Father had given to the Son the whole creation. This was the desire of the Father in creation. It was to be a gift to the Son. It was to be the inheritance of the Son. The whole universe is the firstborn rights of Jesus Christ. Christ is is the heir of all creation. And he's not only the firstborn of all creation. As we go further, we would find out that he's also the means of creation. Again, the belief of the cults and false teachers that Jesus was created would be dismantled as we go further, as we read the following verses. And so we find more reasons why Christ is supreme. Verse 16, For by Him all things were created 
in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. How did the Father create the world? He created the world through the Son. The Son is the means of creation. The Son is not only the image of the invisible God. He is not only the firstborn of all creation, but He is also the means of all creation. That's also seen in John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. That's very clear. Jesus is the means of creation. He was there even before the world began. And he was the means by which all things were created. For by Christ all things were made. And if you're unsure... What all things mean, Paul makes it clear, all things does mean all things because it's whether it, it is in heaven or on earth, all things were created through Christ, whether visible or invisible, whether material or immaterial, it was all created through Christ whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Christ. And the terms here, thrones, dominions, rulers, authorities, they refer to the different rankings of angels. And so all the things that we see in creation and even the things that we don't see like the angels, All things were created through Christ. And some of us probably are asking, but aren't there fallen angels? And so is Jesus also the one who created demons? No, Jesus did not create demons. Now we know that God's original creation was good. The Father created everything through the Son And they were all created good. But some of these angels, even though they were created as good, they rebelled. Some of them rebelled. And that's their loss. All these fallen angels are condemned without hope. Eternal fire is prepared for the devil and his demons. And if you think about it, that could have been our condemnation. That could have been our destiny. That when man rebelled against God, we could have been condemned for eternal hell. But God intervened for us. Unlike in the case of the angels, those who rebelled were not given redemption. Unlike us, and you see the grace and the mercy of God for us, And so, yes, everything was created good, originally good, even the angels. And so the Father is the creator, and the Son is the means of creation. Absolutely everything exists because of God's creative power through Christ. But as we go along, we find that Christ is not only the means of creation, He is also the goal of creation. Verse 16 once again says, For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through Him and for Him. So Jesus is not only the means of creation, He is also the goal of creation. Absolutely everything exists for the praise and honor of Christ. Christ is the goal of creation. Christ is the end of all creation. All the sun, moon, and stars, all the planets and galaxies, 
all were made for Christ. All the seas, all the mountains, all the birds, all the animals, all the men and women that live in this world, everything that exists is for Christ. Everything that is visible or invisible, even the angelic beings were created for Christ. And maybe some are asking, is Christ worthy of that glory? That's definitely what the Jews were asking during Jesus' time here on earth in his earthly ministry. You know, they were appalled that Jesus would claim equality with God. Is Jesus worthy of glory? In the prayer of Jesus, in John 17, verse 1, he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. If you ask Jesus, is he worthy of glory? The answer is yes. Father, glorify your Son. Then verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Very clear here is that Jesus is worthy of glory even before the world began, even before he became incarnated in our world. He was already worthy of glory. Even before his ministry, he is already worthy of glory. But it gets better. He deserves more glory. He gains more glory in salvation. He is worthy of glory in creation, but not only in creation. He deserves glory all the more in salvation. The Father deserves glory. And not only the Father, the Son deserves glory. And this is clear in Revelation. Revelation 4.11, in praise to the Father, it says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power For you created all things, and by your will, they existed and were created. And notice that in Revelation 5.12, the Son is now praised. And compare that now. The praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Revelation 5.12, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom, and might, and honor, and glory, and blessing. Is the Son worthy of glory? Yes, He is. The Son is the Lamb who was slain, and He's worthy of glory. In Revelation 5.13, both the Son and the Father were given glory from all created beings. It says here, And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Jesus is deserving of glory and he deserves that all creation exists for his glory. He is the goal of creation. And you know what? We could just end in that high note, but there's more. The supremacy of Christ is further amplified from one degree to another as we go through the verses. The supremacy of Christ grows higher and higher as we go through these verses. In verse 17, we will see here that Christ is before all creation. Colossians 1.17, And He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Christ is supreme over all creation because He is before all things. 
and F.F. F. Bruce says that Christ is not only, you know, being talked about here as supreme in terms of time. It's not only in a temporal priority to the universe, but this is also suggesting the superiority of Christ. Christ is before all things, therefore He is above all things. He is before all things, therefore He is superior to all things. John 1, 1 1-2 shows us that Jesus eternally existed with the Father and is equal with the Father. It says here, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. And that's why Jesus can say, because He was in the beginning with God, He could say in John 8, 58, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. I am. That's what Jesus said. So Jesus was before Abraham. Jesus was before creation. And very interesting, Jesus could have said, before Abraham was, I was. I existed eternally with the Father. He could have just said, before Abraham was, I was. But he does not say that. He said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. And what is he saying here? It's from the Greek, ego eimi. It's the same words, ego eimi, is the same Greek words that you find in the Septuagint, in the Old Testament, specifically in Exodus 3.14, when the Lord, Yahweh, says, I am who I am. I am who I am. It's the same in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, ego I me, ego I me. Jesus is not only claiming to exist before creation, as he says, I am, he is claiming equality with the Father, equality with the God who spoke to Moses in Exodus 3. Jesus is God. And that's why J- the Jews were angered. They were angered at this because for them, this is blasphemy. It is indeed blasphemy if Jesus is lying, but Jesus is not lying. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is being truthful in his statement that before Abraham was, I am. Christ is supreme over all creation because he is the image of God. He is the firstborn of all creation. He is the means of creation. He is the goal of creation. He is before all creation. And not only that, he is the sustainer of all creation, Colossians 1.17, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And the verb here, hold together, is in the perfect tense, and it is signifying continuous sustaining activity in the universe and everything in it. So what does this mean? Jesus is the sustainer of creation. And that's not only true in the past. Even today, that is true. Jesus continues to sustain the universe. Also in Hebrews 1.3, it says here, He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature, And he upholds the universe by the power, or I'm sorry, by the word of his power. Jesus is holding the entire universe by the word of his power. He is sustaining all creation. He is the sustainer of all creation. 
Why is it our planet is not so near to the sun that all of life gets burned? Why is it that our earth is not too far from the sun that everything just freezes like ice? Why is it that the, the moon is not crashing to the earth? Why is it that the planets in the solar system, they are not bumping and crashing against one another? Why is it that the sun has not exploded to destroy all the planets in our solar system? The reason is that Jesus holds all things together. Jesus upholds the universe by the word of his power. And if he can hold all things in the universe together, then definitely we can trust him to hold all things in our lives. He upholds all things. We're not just here talking about a mere prophet. We're not just talking about a a good moral leader. We're not talking about just some rabbi or an ordinary human being. We're talking about a Christ who is the image of God, the firstborn of all creation, the means of all creation, the goal of all creation, existed eternally before all creation. And He is the sustainer of all creation. That's who our Jesus is. And so how can anyone read Colossians and miss the supremacy of Christ in creation? And as we go further, Christ is not only supreme in creation, He is also supreme in His church. Now let's read Colossians 1.18. And it says here, And He is the head of the body, the church. I've mentioned that um, verses 15 to 20 is a hymn in praise to Christ. And if you look at the structure, it is divided into two parts. Verses 15 to 18 is the first part. And then verses 19 to 20 is, is the second. And if you look at verses 15 to 18 and study the structure you will see that verse 18a is the climax of the first part of the hymn. So in the first part of the hymn, verse 18a, that is the climax of the first part of the hymn. And what is the climax? What is the peak? What is the pinnacle? What is the highest point? What is the apex? of the first part of this hymn. It is Christ as head of the church. You see, what's greater than the creation of the world is the creation of the church. Greater than the creation of the world is the creation of the church, the body of Christ greater than all the sun, moon, and stars, and galaxies is the creation of the church. And knowing this should really help us see the value and importance of the church. Because sadly, right now, there are a lot of uh, Christians who would rather be members of a political party then become members of the church. And even in social media, the debates, the arguments get ugly. And sometimes Christians engage in that. And there are Christians who, who just you know, want to be members of a political party, but they're not members of the church. They're not submitted to the church. Some want to be members of fitness gyms, but not members of the church, members of social clubs, book clubs, student clubs, sports clubs, 
social media groups, but they're not members of the church. There are also those who are like, they like to church hop, Christians who like to church hop, and that's very easy now with uh, virtual services. And they're still looking for that perfect church, the perfect church that does not exist. They experience just a a minor disappointment and they're gone. They go to another church. There are also believers who are too arrogant and too prideful, too unteachable. They think they can do things their own way, that they, they don't need to be members of the church. They don't need accountability to the church. They might be smart, talented, but if they're not submitted to a local church, they don't see the value and importance of the church. And do you think the Lord is pleased with that kind of an attitude? Greater than the creation of the world is the creation of the church. This is so valuable in the heart of God. And yet people treat it as if it's not important that it does not have any value, that they don't need to be members or submitted to the church. What is the church? It's not a building. It is the people. It means assembly. It is the coming together of believers. It's not a human club. It is a divinely created entity. And the word church appears 114 times in the New Testament. And so it's mentioned numerous times. And half of uh, the mention of church comes from Paul. And so the church was in emphasis in the letters of Paul. And here the church is described as a body. This is the metaphor that Paul used And he uses this metaphor even in other places. But it is only here in Colossians and in Ephesians where Christ makes the explicit connection between the body and the head. The explicit connection between the head of the church and who is that head? That head is Christ. Christ is the head of the church. He is the leader. He is the ruler. He is the master. He is the Lord of the church. And this is Paul's distinct contribution to New Testament Christology and ecclesiology that Christ is the head of the body. Christ is the head of the church. And as the head, it is Christ who rules over his people. And as the body, we, the church, we submit, we obey, we listen, we are loyal. We are to be loyal and faithful to our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. And we are to be faithful in all things. And so the question is, is Christ honored as head of your church? Is Christ honored as head of your church? Maybe something or someone else is now overruling Christ. Maybe there's a program or an activity that's given more value, more importance than Christ. Maybe we are valuing and giving more significance to the mission of the church or the ministries in our churches more than the master of the church. Maybe there are people in the church who are more preoccupied with numbers or money or fame, influence, or whatever, instead of being preoccupied with the supremacy of Christ in His church. We need to bow down to the supremacy of Christ and lift up the supremacy of Christ in all things regardless of how many people attend. 
We must lift up the supremacy of Christ regardless of how many money is collected. We must lift up the supremacy of Christ regardless of how much popularity or influence your church has or has not. As head, Christ alone must rule over his church. Christ alone must be supreme. It's also possible that someone is overruling the church, maybe a pastor, an elder, a deacon, an influential person in the church. Yes, again, we are to honor our leaders, but all of us, we need to submit to Christ. And what's a mark of a good leader? A good leader does not point people to himself, but points people to Christ. All pastors, elders, evangelists, youth ministers, Sunday school teachers, all members of the church must bow down to the supremacy of Christ in all things. They must bow down to the supremacy of Christ in His church. Christ is the head. Christ is the Lord. Christ is the master. Step aside and let Him reign and let Him be magnified in His church. Let's make this more personal. How are we? Is Christ still your leader? Is He your Lord and Master? Is He ruling over your life? Are you submitting to Christ? Are you being loyal and obedient to Him? Are you depending on Him in all things? Are you abiding in His Word? Are you spending time in prayer and worship with Him? Are you communing with Christ? Are you, are you submitting to the supremacy of Christ in your life? What is keeping you away from Christ? What is keeping you from displaying the supremacy of Christ in all things. Bow down to the supremacy of Christ. Christ is supreme in creation. He is supreme in the church. And now we will see in verses 18b to 20 that Christ is supreme in salvation. Again, let's go back to Colossians and read Our text, he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Now this uh, term, the beginning, What does this mean? That Christ is the beginning. It means primacy. And Christ's primacy is not only in regards to time, not only in terms that He is eternal, but it it is also referring to the superiority of Christ. We've already seen that Jesus is the Word. And He is the Word who was in the beginning with God, in the beginning with the Father. We've seen that Jesus is the one who said, before Abraham was, I am, I am. And there's more verses that talk about the eternality of Christ and the superiority of Christ. Revelation 22, 13, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Jesus is supreme, not only in regards to time, not only that He is eternal, but He is superior over all. Hebrews 1, 8 to 12, But of the Son He says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter 
of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And you, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning. And the heavens are the works or the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all wear out like a garment, like a robe. You will roll them up like a garment. They will be changed, but you are the same. And your years will have no end. And so what do we find here? The author of Hebrews stating the primacy of Christ, not only in time, but it also speaks about His superiority above all. He is supreme and superior to all. He is the Son of God. And the Son of God is the Lord. And He is the God who will reign forever and ever. Christ is the beginning. And that's why He is supreme in salvation. He is superior overall. And not only that, He's the firstborn from the dead. The primacy of Christ is not only connected to Him being above creation, being eternal, being superior. It is also created to, it is also connected rather to His resurrection. The primacy of Christ related and applied to His resurrection. And it says here that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Again, we find that term firstborn, and it's all about a title, a position. It's talking about preeminence, supremacy of Christ. And we know that Jesus here is not the first to be resurrected from the dead. It's not literal that he's the first ever to be resurrected from the dead. And we know that uh, Lazarus was resurrected from the dead before Christ. And it's even Jesus who resurrected Lazarus from the dead. So what does this mean? It does not mean that Jesus was first to be resurrected from the dead, but that he was the first to resurrect from the dead in 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 a glorified state, in a glorified body. He is the firstborn from the dead. He has primacy, supremacy in his resurrection because he is the one who is resurrected in a glorified body. That's why he is preeminent and supreme in resurrection. And in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that Christ is the first fruits, the first fruits of the future resurrection of believers. And what does that mean? It means that the resurrection of Christ made our resurrection possible. Without the resurrection of Christ, we would not have this hope. We have a dying and decaying body, but we have a hope of a resurrected body. And that is all because of Jesus Christ. That is all because of His resurrection. And so He is preeminent in resurrection. Again, Colossians 1.18, He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. We've seen in verse 15 that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. And now in verse 18, he is the firstborn from the dead. Jesus is not only supreme in creation, he is also supreme in resurrection. And that's why if he's supreme in creation and supreme in resurrection, where else is he not supreme? He is supreme in all things. Supreme in creation, supreme in resurrection. Therefore, He is preeminent in all things. 
He is supreme in all things. There is no area or realm that Christ is not supreme. And we've seen just the greatness of Christ in salvation, that he is the beginning, is the firstborn from the dead. And not only that, we've seen that Jesus is equal to the Father, that he is no ordinary human being, and that he's Lord over the church. And if ever there's still some who are doubting the supremacy of Christ, if ever there's still someone who's doubting the deity of Christ, Paul writes here in Colossians 1.19, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Christ is completely God. All the fullness of God dwelt, resided in Christ. And the term here, fullness, it denotes completeness. And that uh, idea of completeness is further amplified by the word all. Jesus is not only, you know, fully God, completely God, but all the fullness of God. All the completeness of God was pleased to dwell in Christ. There isn't anything in the essence or nature or substance. There isn't anything in Christ that makes him inferior to the Father and to the Spirit. Jesus is God in the most absolute sense, equal with the Father and the Spirit. All that God is in His person and work is summed up in Christ. All the attributes of God find their home in Christ. All the fullness, all the completeness of God resides in Christ. There was never a time even that Jesus was not God. All the fullness of God did not dwell, you know, during the baptism or only during his transfiguration or during or after his uh, resurrection. No, even in eternity past, Jesus was completely God. All the fullness of God resided in him, even in eternity past. He's truly God in the past, truly God in the present, truly God in the future. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will continue to be God for the rest of eternity. And lastly, verse 20, we find here that Christ is the Savior of the world. He is the beginning. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is completely God. And he's the firstborn, I'm sorry, he's the savior of the world. Colossians 1.20 And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. This verse is the conclusion. This verse is the high point of the entire hymn. It's not just in one part of the hymn that this is the high point of the entire hymn. This entire hymn is pointing to this as the high point, the conclusion, the climax of everything that we have just been talking about. God created a perfect and harmonious world through Jesus but we know that sin disturbed and disrupted God's creation. And God acted out in grace to bring about reconciliation and he uh, achieved decisive reconciliation through Christ. There's a lot of quarrels and fights and wars and rumors of wars, Israel versus Palestine, China versus the Philippines, 
There's wars in cultures, in race, in academia, in politics, in religion. And everything seems to be getting worse and worse. And the divide amongst fellow human beings gets wider and wider and wider. Peace treaties have been signed, but they have failed. The solution for true and lasting reconciliation is not through educational, political, social, cultural, even religious means. The solution is a person, and that person is Christ. Through Christ, all things, whether on earth or in heaven, all things will be reconciled to himself. At the end of the day, everyone would bow down. And you would bow down either in humility, in allegiance to Christ, or you would bow down because you have failed in your uprising and your rebellion and you're brought to subjugation because Jesus is Lord. How did Jesus achieve this reconciliation? He did it by having made peace by the blood of his cross. Reconciliation was achieved through the rugged cross. Reconciliation was decisively achieved through the rugged cross. Peace was brought about through the violent yet victorious death of Jesus on the cross. Violent yet victorious. And it's only through Jesus and his sacrifice that reconciliation has been brought about in all things. And this will ultimately lead to everyone being under his rule and authority in all creation would be made new, all because of the rugged cross, all because of the violent yet victorious death of Jesus. Now, sometimes Christians share the gospel and we share the gospel and we act like salesmen and women. We try to advertise Christ, you know, some Christians try to advertise Christ and uh, see Christ as a product to sell. And so, you know, you, you need to have uh, the right kind of packaging. They say things like, try Jesus or receive Jesus today and you will win a one-way ticket to heaven. Or accept Jesus today and you'll receive all these benefits, forgiveness, joy, peace. Now, while it is true that you will indeed have peace, you will have joy, you will spend eternity with God if you receive Christ, but Christ is not a product. And we are not salesmen or women. We're not trying to manipulate people or twist people's arm into buying Christ, into receiving Christ. This is not how the apostles shared the gospel. It's not try Jesus. It is repent and believe in the gospel. Why? Because there is salvation in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no salvation outside of Christ, repent and believe. What did we see in Colossians 1, 15 to 20? We did not see a Christ who is a product that we need to, you know, manipulate people in order for them to believe. We saw a Christ who is supreme, a Christ whom we must all bow the knee our message is not try Jesus. Our message is stop your rebellion, surrender to the supremacy of Christ. Bow down to the supremacy of Christ. And who is Christ? He is the image of God, the firstborn of all creation, the means of creation, the goal 
of creation. He is eternal before all creation. He is the sustainer of creation. He is the head of the church, the Lord, the master of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. He is completely God. And all that God is resides in Christ. He is the Savior of the world who brought about reconciliation through His rugged cross. Supreme in creation. Supreme in the church. Supreme in salvation. Is He supreme in your life? Is He supreme in your church? Heavenly Father, we thank and praise You for this time that we've spent. And even as we have dug out all these diamonds from Your Word, these are just still a glimpse of the glory and the supremacy of Christ. And one day, we would have that beatific vision. And we would, at that time, be able to see already the supremacy and the glory of Christ. We long for that day. But since, Heavenly Father, you have not yet called us home, our mission here has not yet ended. And we pray indeed that God, you would be glorified in our lives and that people would see the supremacy of Christ in our lives, that we would display his greatness, that we would magnify Christ and that we would point people to Christ, that we would bow down to Christ who is supreme over all. May Christ be supreme in our lives. May Christ be supreme in our churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.